On the evening of Wednesday, May 21st, 1924, a man named Jacob Franks walked up the steps to his mansion, and right as he went to open his door, his butler opened it up, welcomed him inside, and Jacob smiled at the butler and stepped in. Jacob had just spent a long day at his office in Chicago, Illinois, doing a big real estate deal, and now he was just happy to be home with his wife and his three kids. Jacob was an incredibly successful business person who had made a name for himself first in the early 1900s when he ran a bank that specialized in giving out these enormous loans to gamblers. But it wasn't until he was named the president of the Rockford Watch Company and he expanded into real estate that he became outrageously wealthy. His fortune in today's dollars would have been around $70 million. But now that Jacob was so well established in the business world in Chicago, he was trying to make a more conscious effort to spend more time at home with his wife and kids. And so as soon as he walked past his butler into his mansion, he hung up his hat and his jacket, and he went to find his wife, Flora, to tell her about an idea he had for a trip for that upcoming weekend. But when Jacob found Flora, she was not remotely interested in talking about their weekend plans because Flora was very worked up about their youngest son, Bobby. Bobby, who was 14 years old, was supposed to come home right after school, but it was now 6 p.m. and he still hadn't shown up and she had no idea where he was. And Jacob's reaction to this news was just to feel kind of aggravated. Bobby was generally a really good kid. He was a student at a prestigious boys' school right down the road, and his teacher was convinced that Bobby was the smartest kid in his entire grade. Bobby was a member of the school's debate team and regularly beat the older kids. And Bobby was just a natural leader and very hardworking and kind. But Bobby could also be fairly irresponsible sometimes, specifically in terms of coming home on time. This was not the first time that Bobby had not come home by curfew. So Jacob told Flora, you know, don't worry about it. This is something Bobby does. He likely lost track of time. And as Jacob and Flora are having this discussion, Bobby's older brother came into the room and suggested to his dad, Jacob, that perhaps Bobby was across the street at Richard's house. Richard was Bobby's cousin playing tennis on their private court. Richard and Bobby were quite close, even though they were four years apart. Richard was 18, Bobby was 14, but they really bonded over tennis. And so that was something they did all the time. And so Jacob said he would go across the street and see if Bobby was there. And he also told his wife, Flora, to just continue to call around town and see if anybody knew where Bobby might be. And so Jacob left his mansion and began walking across the street towards Richard's family's mansion to see if his son was there. Now, this neighborhood that Jacob lived in was one of the most exclusive neighborhoods really in the entire country, but definitely within Chicago's city limits. It was called South Kenwood, and basically imagine a street where every house is a huge mansion, and every mansion is home to some business tycoon or famous person, and all the families who lived in this neighborhood had a full staff of maids and butlers and drivers and fleets of private cars. I mean, these people who lived in South Kenwood were literally the richest of the rich. And so Jacob, he gets across the street, he's standing in front of Richard's family's mansion, and he looks around the side and he can see the private tennis court where his son and Richard would always play, but it's totally vacant, and in fact, the house is just totally quiet. No one's home. When Jacob got back to his own home, he found his wife pacing around in the parlor looking really concerned, and so Jacob immediately asked her, you know, what'd you learn? What's going on? And she would tell Jacob that she had spoken to one of Bobby's friends who told her that Bobby had umpired a baseball game after school and had left to walk back home at around 5 p.m. The school and the baseball field where Bobby would have been was only about three blocks away from their home. And now it was 6.30 p.m. So it's been an hour and a half since Bobby had supposedly began his walk home. And so by now he certainly should be here, but of course he wasn't. At this point, Jacob went from feeling aggravated with his son to being concerned for his son's safety. Despite the fact that he's thinking, okay, well, my son is likely somewhere in this neighborhood in South Kenwood, one of the safest, richest, best places in the country, he's got to be okay, but I really want to find him. And so Jacob would call one of his very close friends who lived in this neighborhood, who also happened to be a former state senator, and he asked him to come over and basically look around the neighborhood for Bobby. When the state senator friend arrived at Jacob's house, 
The two men left and began walking down the street lined with mansions, making their way towards the school where Bobby supposedly had been umpiring. And when they got there, they saw there was no baseball game happening and the school was dark and closed for the night. But Jacob and his friend decided that, you know, maybe it was possible that after umpiring this game, when Bobby had begun his walk home, maybe he had taken a detour into the school to get something and then perhaps the doors got shut and locked on him. And so Jacob and his friend went to the school and looked for a way to basically break into the school. And sure enough, they would find an open window, they'd open it up, they would climb inside, and they would search the entire school, but Bobby was not in there. At this point, Jacob was really starting to panic. His friend was trying to calm him down, but Jacob is now thinking, something is terribly wrong with my son. And so the two men actually ran from the school back to Jacob's house. And when they went inside, Jacob immediately called out to his wife to see if maybe she had located Bobby. But when he called Flora's name, there was no response. And so Jacob and his friend, they run inside and they make their way towards the parlor, which is where they had last seen Flora before they left. And when they walked in there, they found Flora lying on the ground, totally lifeless, with the phone off the hook right next to her hand. And so Jacob and the senator, they run over and they begin shaking Flora. And suddenly she wakes up with a gasp and she looks up at Jacob and just begins sobbing hysterically. And after Jacob finally calmed her down, she would tell him that after they had left to go to the school, she had received a phone call. And at first she thought it was Bobby calling to check in. But when she answered it, it wasn't Bobby. It was a man's voice she didn't recognize who told her that Bobby had been kidnapped. He was safe for now, but if they went to police, something terrible would happen to him. This mystery man also told Flora that they would be in touch soon with more information, and then they hung up. And Flora had been so overwhelmed by what she was told that she had fainted, and that was why they found her on the ground. That night, Jacob, Flora, and the state senator friend stayed up late going over, you know, what they should do. Of course they wanted to go to police, but this felt like a credible threat that Bobby could be harmed if they did that. And so they just went back and forth and back and forth over how to handle this horrible situation. But by 2 a.m., they had made a decision. The state senator had some close friends and connections in the police department, and so they decided that they would go talk to the police, but they would swear them to secrecy so so the kidnapper or kidnappers wouldn't know the police were investigating. And so a few hours later, when the police department opened up, Jacob and the state senator friend went to the police. They spoke to the highest ranking officer who was sworn to secrecy. And then that morning, the police would begin a quiet investigation into Bobby's kidnapping. At the same time this investigation was beginning on the morning of May 22nd, 1924, a man named Morton D. Ballard drove through downtown Chicago in a luxury car known as a Willis Knight. He pulled this luxury car into a parking lot right next to a rental car company, and after parking the car, Morton got out, he went inside of the shop, and he handed the keys over to the clerk behind the desk. The clerk would ask Morton, you know, how did it go with your rental car? And Morton would say, oh, it was perfect, went totally fine. After that, Morton thanked the clerk, he turned around and walked outside where another luxury car was waiting for him, being driven by his good friend, Lewis Mason. And once Morton had climbed inside, the two men smiled and drove off and disappeared into traffic. That same morning, Jacob and Flora received a letter from the kidnapper or kidnappers demanding $10,000 in small unmarked bills, and if they gave this money over, they would get their son back. And immediately, Jacob went to the bank and got the money, but before he could actually deliver the money to the kidnappers at the location they had specified in this letter, the police, who were quietly investigating, discovered a clue that would break the case wide open. It would take over a week to unravel this bizarre clue, but it all started to come together when the police brought in Morton D. Ballard and Lewis Mason for questioning. Here is the shocking story that detectives were finally able to piece together about what happened to Bobby Franks. On May 7th, 1924, so two weeks before Bobby went missing, Morton D. Ballard walked into a hotel in Chicago called the Morrison and rented room 1031. He would tell the front desk that he wanted them to hold his mail for him, and over the next couple of days, Morton would come in and he would get his mail from the front desk, but he didn't appear to ever actually go up to his room. 
Finally, a suspicious maid at the Morrison Hotel, who had been going into room 1031 every day to clean it, only to discover that Morton was not in there and the room was totally untouched and clean already, she went in one morning and saw Morton was not in there, and she would actually just open up one of Morton's suitcases that he had left inside. And instead of the suitcase containing clothes or toiletries, it just contained a bunch of random library books. As it happened, after this maid found this strange suitcase full of books, Morton stopped coming to the hotel. He stopped getting his mail, he did not claim his luggage, and he didn't pay the bill. He just kind of vanished. On May 9th, so just a couple of days after Morton first booked that room at the Morrison Hotel, Morton also opened a bank account in Chicago. He also made his first appearance at that car rental company where he asked for the Willis Knight car. The rental company would not just let anybody take a Willis Knight car, you needed a reference to show that you were someone who could pay for this type of vehicle, and so Morton's friend, Lewis Mason, would give him that reference and allow him to rent the Willis Knight car. About a week and a half later, on May 21st, so the day Bobby went missing, Morton and Lewis were driving around South Kenwood in their Willis Knight car when they spotted Bobby by himself walking down the road. Now, Lewis recognized Bobby, and he knew that Bobby was an incredible tennis player, and Lewis had a question for Bobby about a particular tennis racket. And so Lewis, who was in the front seat of the car, told Morton, who was driving, to pull over so Lewis could talk to Bobby. And so Morton pulled over, Lewis rolled his window down, he called over to Bobby, Bobby came over, and before long, Lewis and Bobby were talking about this tennis racket. And then when that conversation naturally wrapped up, Lewis offered Bobby a ride the rest of the way home, because that was where Bobby was walking to when they stopped him. And so Lewis climbed into the back seat, Morton stayed in the driver's seat, and Bobby climbed inside and sat in the front seat. And then once those two were situated, Morton pulled away from the curb and began driving towards Bobby's house. And as they were driving to Bobby's house, Bobby just kind of continued talking about this tennis racket because that was the thing they were talking about. And as he was mid-sentence, Lewis from the back seat reached into his pocket, pulled out a chisel, and then lunged forward and began smashing Bobby in the back of the head over and over again with this chisel. And as Bobby is screaming in pain and trying to protect himself, Lewis lunges forward, grabs Bobby, drags him into the back seat, and then holds him down, pulls a rag out of his pocket, and jams it into Bobby's throat. And then he closes Bobby's mouth and holds it shut until Bobby goes still. After that, Lewis kind of grimaced at all of Bobby's blood all over him, and he kind of pushed Bobby down onto the floorboards below, and then Lewis calmly climbed back into the front seat and sat down, and meanwhile, Morton has not remotely reacted to what's just happened. This is just business as usual. Morton and Lewis did not go to Bobby's house, but instead drove towards Indiana. And on their drive to Indiana, they would stop at a roadside restaurant and eat hot dogs and root beers with their car parked right near this restaurant with Bobby's body just totally exposed laying out on the floorboards of the back seat. Morton and Lewis would eventually get into Indiana and they would head to this particular forest that Morton was familiar with because he was a bird watcher and often came out here. And when they got to this forest, they parked in this clearing, they got out, they checked on Bobby and confirmed that he was dead. So they pulled him out, they stripped all of his clothes off of him, they rolled him up in a rug, and then they dragged him over to this drainage pipe that sat underneath some railroad tracks in this swampy area and they jammed him inside of it. And then they got back in their car they drove back to Chicago, at which point Morton called Bobby's mother, Flora, and informed her that her son was kidnapped, but alive, even though he wasn't, and don't call the police, we'll be in touch soon. That night, Morton and Lewis would burn all of the clothes they had stripped off of Bobby. They would also clean the interior of their Willis Knight rental car, and then they would play a game of cards together before going to bed. The next day, May 22nd, so the same day that police began their quiet investigation into Bobby's kidnapping, Morton and Lewis would send that letter to Jacob and Flora demanding $10,000 for the safe return of Bobby, but unfortunately, before Lewis and Morton could claim their ransom money, 
Bobby's body was discovered. In fact, that day he was discovered. A walker was cutting through the woods in Indiana and saw Bobby in the pipe. And so when Morton and Lewis realized that, you know, the jig is up, the family's never going to pay for their son because he's dead, they just returned their Willis Knight rental car and went back to their normal lives as if nothing had ever happened. But unbeknownst to him, Morton had accidentally dropped his eyeglasses right next to Bobby's body when they dumped him in the woods in Indiana. And Morton's eyeglasses were very unique. In fact, there was only one store in the world that sold this particular kind of eyeglasses. And so when detectives got the call about Bobby's body being found, they would also find these glasses. And that was the big clue because these glasses led detectives to the store where they were sold, and the owner of the store was able to say that, yep, those particular glasses were sold to Morton. And when detectives went to Morton, Morton immediately pointed the finger at Lewis, saying that Morton didn't do anything to Bobby, Lewis did. But about a week later, on May 31st, both Morton and Lewis would confess to police that they murdered Bobby. But far more shocking than what Morton and Lewis had done was who they were. Because Morton and Lewis were not their real names. The two men who killed Bobby Franks were rich kids just like Bobby who lived in South Kenwood. They created two fake names, Morton D. Ballard and Lewis Mason, and then they booked room 1031 at the Morrison Hotel. Now, they had no intention of actually staying at this hotel, and so they just left that suitcase full of books inside of the room to make it appear like they were staying there. But in reality, the only reason they booked that room is they needed a physical mailing address that was connected to their fake personas. And so after booking this room, they began sending mail to Morton D. Ballard and Lewis Mason at the Morrison Hotel, room 1031. And then after collecting that mail, which served as a sort of proof of legal name and address, they were able to open a bank account in Chicago, they dumped some money into that, and then again they used their proof of legal name and address to rent that Willis Knight car, and then used money from their phony bank account to pay for it. And then once they had their luxury car, it was time to go kill. In reality, Morton was actually a 19-year-old prodigy named Nathan Leopold. He spoke five languages, he had already graduated from college, and he was a nationally respected ornithologist, which is someone who studies birds. Nathan's IQ was so high, it literally couldn't be measured. His father was the president of a very successful steamship company, and Nathan was planning to attend Harvard University in the fall to get yet another college degree. And Lewis was actually 18-year-old Richard Loeb, who was Bobby's cousin and one of his best friends. Bobby and Richard played tennis together all the time in Richard's private court, which is where Bobby's father went first to go looking for his son. Like Nathan, Richard was also a genius. He was the youngest person ever to have graduated from the University of Michigan. He graduated at 17 years old. And to celebrate the occasion, Richard's father, who in today's dollars was worth about $175 million, he was a retired vice president for the major retail store Sears, he bought Richard a custom golf course. He built him his own golf course. That was his graduation present. And at the time of Bobby's murder, Richard was actually enrolled at the University of Chicago's law school, studying to become a lawyer. Nathan and Richard would very proudly tell investigators that they didn't kill Bobby to get money out of his parents. Nathan and Richard were fabulously wealthy. The money meant nothing. Instead, they had come up with this scheme and killed Bobby because of their belief in the philosopher Nietzsche's concept of Superman men whose superiority allows them to rise above all ordinary rules, ethics, and laws. Basically, Nathan and Richard believed they were so much better than everybody else in the world that if they wanted to kill someone, they should be able to. And Bobby seemed like a pretty easy target. After Nathan and Richard confessed, they were put under arrest but a chauffeur was allowed to come to the police station and drop off silk pajamas for them to wear in custody. And instead of being held in a cell, they were allowed to stay in a hotel. But ultimately, they both were sentenced to life in prison. Bobby's family never recovered from his murder, and his father, Jacob, would die just four years after his son died. 
As for Nathan, he would be murdered in prison in 1936 by another inmate. And as for Richard, he would serve his time and get paroled and then die of natural causes in 1971. Today, the murder of Bobby Franks is often referred to as the crime of the century. One morning in early June of 2011, in the Russian city of Kazan, a 49-year-old Russian woman named Fagiliu Mukametsanov woke up feeling nauseous. Fagiliu had recently had some health problems, and her doctors had told her that she really needed to take it easy, don't do anything that really stressed her out or made her mad, you know, basically just relax. And so, on that morning, this is exactly what Fagiliu decided to do. Instead of pushing through her nausea to go to work anyways that day, she decided she would call out from work and stay home and have some tea and try to just feel better. But a little while later, when Fagiliu was in the kitchen making tea, her husband, Fajili, he came in and asked her how she was doing, and she said, you know what, I actually feel worse. You know, my nausea has gotten worse, my chest hurts, and I'm starting to sweat. I'm going to go lie down in the bedroom. But as Fagiliu walked across the kitchen to go lay down, her chest suddenly tightened tenfold, and she collapsed to the ground unconscious. Fajili rushed over to her and tried to wake her up, and when he couldn't, he rushed to the phone and dialed 112, which is Russia's emergency line, and he called for an ambulance. And then when the ambulance arrived, Fagiliu was not breathing, and by the time they got her to the hospital, she was declared dead. She had died from a heart attack. Fajili, who had been married to Fagiliu, his wife, for almost 30 years, was absolutely heartbroken, but he and his wife's religion encouraged people to have funerals within 24 hours of a loved one passing away. And so despite the fact that Fajili was basically despondent from all his grief, he pretty much immediately began calling relatives and friends and making preparations for Fagiliu's funeral, which would take place the next day. The next morning, Fajili woke up and put on his best suit, and then he joined his and his wife's family and friends at the funeral home for Fagiliu's funeral. When Fajili walked inside of the funeral home, he saw there were all these wooden chairs facing forward towards the front of the room, and at the front of the room, up on a table, was his wife's coffin, which was open and surrounded by all the flowers that Fajili had barely been able to buy with the little bit of money that he and his wife had. Fajili slowly made his way down the middle of the room to his wife's coffin, and the other people that were there saw him coming and got out of the way in respect to, you know, the husband of the deceased. And so Fajili, he walks up and he looks down at his wife, who again, you know, it's open casket so he can see her, and he was struck by her appearance. She just did not look right. Now, Fajili did not have enough money to embalm his wife, which means to preserve a dead body and make it look like it's very lifelike. And so instead, the people who worked in this funeral home had just applied heavy makeup to Fagilio's face to try to make her appear more lifelike, but it really hadn't worked. To Fajili, it didn't even look like his wife. After all, Fagiliu never even wore makeup, and so to see her with heavy eyeliner and bright red lipstick was just totally bizarre. Behind Fajili was Fajili's family and Fagiliu's relatives all assembled in the first row, and they were beginning their prayers for the dead. And so Fajili, he took a few more looks at his wife, and then he stepped back and joined the first row. And so as Fajili was standing there holding his mother's and brother's hand, he closed his eyes and did his best to focus on the words of the prayer instead of on the grief he was feeling for his wife. And as he was doing that, his mother, who was on his right side, suddenly broke from the words of the prayer and let out this strange crying sound. And Fajili, he opened his eyes and looked over at his mother, expecting her to be collapsed on the ground from all the grief she was experiencing. But instead, he saw his mother was trembling and looking straight ahead. And so Fajili followed her gaze, and what he saw at the front of the room made Fajili want to faint. His wife, Fagiliu, was now sitting straight up in her coffin. She wasn't making a sound, but she was looking out at the crowd of people with her strange makeup on her face, just staring at them with wide eyes. 
And for a second, everybody in the funeral home noticed this and went totally quiet. And both Fagiliu and the mourners just stared at each other. And then Fagiliu began screaming, but at first it was like she couldn't make any sound. And it was this raspy, dry yell that was coming out of her mouth. But then it built and built until it was sort of like a bellow or a roar. And when this loud, deep, guttural sound began coming out of Fagiliu's mouth, the mourners in the room began screaming too. And suddenly it was absolute chaos inside of this building. As funeral workers rushed to call emergency services, not knowing what else to do, Fajili, who also had been screaming after seeing his wife arise from the dead, he kind of snapped out of it and ran to his wife and he embraced her. And when he did, Fagiliu went from screaming to silent. And she looked up at her husband with wide, scared eyes and began crying. And then she slumped forward into Fajili's arms. At this point, Fajili's family and Fagiliu's family saw what was happening and they kind of snapped out of it too and they rushed forward and they helped Fajili lift Fagiliu out of her coffin and they laid her down on the ground. And even though she wasn't moving, her eyes were open and she was looking up at her family just absolutely terrified with all her makeup running from her tears. And then 12 minutes later, when Fagiliu finally was rushed to the hospital, she was declared dead again. It would turn out that when Fagiliu collapsed on her kitchen floor, she really did have a heart attack, but it didn't kill her. She was just unconscious and her breathing was very shallow and she wasn't moving and nobody noticed. And so when Fagiliu kind of came to and woke up inside of her coffin at her funeral, she likely was okay, you know, all things considered, she was, you know, healthy enough to be alive, but when she looked around the room and saw she was at her own funeral and sitting in her coffin, the stress of that moment had given her another heart attack. And this one had been fatal. On October 15th, 2003, a newlywed couple named Tina and Gabe Watson arrived in Australia for their honeymoon. They were both 26 years old and lived in Alabama, and neither of them made very much money. Tina worked in the kids' department of a clothing store, and Gabe worked for his father at a packaging company. But Gabe's family had gifted this honeymoon trip to Australia to Gabe and Tina, and so the couple was so excited about it, and they had taken actually a whole year to plan this trip out. It was going to be the adventure of their lives. Once in Australia, the couple spent the first week in Sydney, which is one of the biggest cities in the country. They went on a river cruise, they visited the famous Sydney Opera House, and they went to see the koalas at the zoo, something Tina was very intent on doing because she loved animals. And then on October 21st, so six days into their big trip, the couple headed north to the city of Townsville, which is this beautiful beach town that's right near the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest and most famous coral reef system. This was going to be the real highlight of their trip. Gabe had grown up loving the water, and now as an adult, his passion was scuba diving. He was a trained rescue diver, and any chance he got back home in Alabama, he would go diving. As for Tina, scuba diving kind of scared her. She didn't like the idea of being underwater for extended periods of time and breathing in underwater. It just felt so foreign that she didn't like it. But she knew Gabe really wanted her to go scuba diving with him in Australia. And so 10 months earlier in January of 2003, Tina had begun taking scuba diving lessons, and then right before they headed out for this trip to Australia, Tina had gotten certified in scuba diving. So after arriving in Townsville, Gabe and Tina would spend the night in a hotel, and then early the next morning, the couple would get up and make their way down to the dock where they would board a diving boat. This boat was going to take them out into the open water, right over this famous shipwreck called the Yongola, where lots of people scuba dive, and this Yongola wreck is right near the Great Barrier Reef. So it's a truly amazing place to go scuba diving. When the couple actually was out on the open water, they looked around and just could not believe how stunning everything really was. The beach town at a distance was unbelievable and the water was perfectly clear blue where they could see thousands of fish shimmering and swimming all around them. Finally, the dive boat came to a stop over the area where the Yongola wreck was 
and Gabe and Tina began putting on their dive gear, as did the other four tourists who were also on this diving trip. Now, Gabe and Tina were dive partners, which meant for this dive, they were instructed not to leave each other really at any point until they're back on the surface. But initially, once they and the other divers were put into the water, the entire group swam down together 100 feet to the bottom of the ocean where this shipwreck was. And at first, everything was going great. The swim down was easy. And then once they got down there, because the water was so clear and sunlight could reach them, they were able to look at each other and just really take in how spectacular this really was but unfortunately Gabe he looked at his wrist at some point and noticed his dive computer which tells you how much air you have left and what depth you're at was malfunctioning and so he signaled to Tina that he needed to go to the surface and get his computer fixed and so he and Tina would swim away from the group back up to the surface and then once on the surface Gabe was able to talk to the dive leader on the boat and he was able to get his dive computer fixed and then after only a couple of minutes of being back on the surface Gabe and Tina went back under the water and began heading back down towards the rest of the group. And as Gabe and Tina approached the rest of the group, they saw they were all kind of swimming around in dive pairs around the Yungola wreck. And so Gabe and Tina, they got down there and they joined the queue and began as well moving as a pair around the wreck. Back up on the surface, the dive leader, who was up in the boat, was just kind of sitting there waiting for the divers to come back up, when all of a sudden he noticed there was this sudden eruption of air bubbles coming up to the surface. And so he peered over the side of the boat to see what was going on, and Gabe, who had only left the surface after fixing his dive computer maybe five minutes earlier, came bombing up out of the water. And when he did, the dive leader immediately noticed that Tina was not with him. And before the dive leader could even ask Gabe what was going on, Gabe, who was obviously very panicked, he ripped off his mask and he began trying to tell the dive leader that something was wrong with his wife, that she had sunk away from him and he couldn't get to her and he needed help. And so the dive leader immediately put on a scuba tank, he jumped in the water and swam down as fast as he could to the wreck down below. And when he got there, he immediately saw Tina by herself laying on the sand on the bottom of the ocean, just totally motionless on her back. And so the dive leader, he swam over to her, he scooped her up, and he brought her all the way back to the surface. And then once on the surface, he put Tina into the boat, and then the dive leader, he climbed inside and immediately began doing CPR on Tina. And for 45 minutes, the dive leader tried to do CPR, tried everything he could to save Tina, but unfortunately, it was not enough, and Tina passed away. An autopsy would later reveal that Tina had died from something called an air embolism, which is when an air bubble gets trapped in a blood vessel and blocks it. In scuba divers, this can happen from holding your breath for too long or trying to ascend too quickly. One theory about how this could have happened to Tina was based on what Gabe said happened when he and Tina went back down to the wreck after he got his dive computer fixed. He said they got down there, everything was fine, they were swimming around like the other dive pairs, taking pictures, when Tina started to panic, kind of randomly, and she reached out for Gabe, and Gabe said she knocked his oxygen mask off his face, and so Gabe was kind of starting to panic, and he got the mask back on, at which point Tina was kind of floating away from him, and so Gabe, not really knowing what to do, said he went to the surface to get help. And so in that time frame, perhaps Tina, you know, tried to rush to the surface on her own, giving herself the air embolism, or maybe in her panic, she had held her breath, giving herself the air embolism. But it wasn't long after Tina's death was ruled an accident and the case was closed that the other four people who were on that dive with Gabe and Tina began reaching out to Tina's family. These divers had seen something very strange happen right around the time Tina died and they felt like they had to tell someone. One of these four divers would tell Tina's family that as they were swimming around the wreck, they saw Gabe and Tina come back down after Gabe had fixed his dive computer. And pretty quickly after they reached the bottom, Gabe seemed to give Tina a hug, like a really strong bear hug. Now, there's no reason any diver would hug another diver underwater, certainly not that hard, unless it was some sort of rescue attempt. And this diver who witnessed this told Tina's family that this did not look like a rescue attempt. It looked like Gabe was trying to restrain Tina and Tina was trying to get away from Gabe. 
After a few moments of watching this, the same diver would see Gabe release Tina, and at that point, Tina would go limp and float to the bottom, and Gabe would rush to the surface where he would tell the dive leader that he had this emergency with his wife. This new information led Australian authorities to charge Gabe with murder. They alleged that Gabe intentionally turned off Tina's air and then put her in that bear hug to make sure she couldn't turn it back on again. Gabe, however, has always denied this, saying his wife really just panicked and he was trying to help her but couldn't and then went to the surface. Gabe ultimately pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter in Australia and served 18 months in prison. Prosecutors in Alabama then also tried to charge Gabe with murder or something else in connection to Tina's death, but ultimately a judge dismissed the case. One final note about this story, which also happens to be the reason most people know about this story, is that two of the four divers who were down there with Gabe and Tina were taking underwater pictures at the time that Tina died. Here is a photo they developed from this trip, which clearly shows Tina in the background just moments after Gabe had released her and she sunk to the bottom and died. In July of 1848, a 25-year-old man named Phineas Gage got a job working construction on the Hudson River Railroad in New York. At this time in America, railroads were being laid all over the country, and so lots of workers like Phineas were needed to blast rock out of the way to lay down these railroad tracks. And as it happened, Phineas was an expert in explosives. He had learned how to set controlled blasts growing up on his family's farm in New Hampshire, and then later in his life, he had worked in a mine blasting through rock. And so in addition to just being the ideal railroad worker for this time in America, when Phineas actually started working in New York on this railroad, his co-workers immediately started looking up to him. Phineas was extremely smart and energetic. He was this incredible conversationalist. He was charismatic and funny and a natural leader. And so just two months into starting this new job, it was no surprise to anyone who knew Phineas or worked with Phineas that he was promoted to blasting foreman, which meant Phineas would lead the explosives team. Phineas was so excited about this promotion that he went to a blacksmith and had a custom tamping iron made. A tamping iron is a long metal rod that's used to pack explosives. When railroad workers wanted to blast through, let's say, a big rock, they would start by drilling a deep but skinny hole in the rock, then they would pour blasting powder inside, then they'd put a fuse inside, and then using this tamping iron, they would push the blasting powder and the fuse deep into this hole inside of this rock or whatever it was they were blowing up. And then once it was packed, they would ignite it. Usually, tamping irons were sort of rough tools that looked like crowbars, but Phineas really wanted something special to commemorate this promotion. And so Phineas had the blacksmith make this perfectly straight, smooth, four foot long metal tamping iron. And on one end was a pointed side and on the other was a blunted side. And this rod, it weighed about 13 pounds and it was about an inch and a quarter in diameter. And Phineas loved this tamping iron. He brought it with him, not just to work, but basically anywhere he went. On September 3rd, 1848, so not long after Phineas's big promotion, Phineas and his explosives team were blasting through some rock that ran through a forest. And Phineas, he was right up front over the blasting site, helping them prep the explosive. His team had drilled that long, deep, skinny hole into the rock they were about to blow up. And then blasting powder was put inside, a fuse was put inside. And then Phineas took his tamping iron and began packing the powder and fuse deep into the rock. And the way he did this is he used the blunt end of his tamping iron to pack the explosives, which meant the pointed end was sticking out of the rock. And so as Phineas is doing this, someone behind him slipped on a rock. One of his men tripped or something. And so Phineas, with his hands kind of on his tamping iron, turned to the right to look and see what was going on. And when he did this, somehow his tamping iron that was inside of this skinny hole must have nudged against the inside of the rock, created a spark, and ignited the explosive inside of the rock, which meant the tamping iron was basically fired like a missile out of this hole 
into Phineas's head. It went in his cheek, up behind his left eye, up and out of his skull, and then shot 80 feet away, landing on the ground covered in Phineas's blood and brains. This happens so quickly that for a second after this thing has blown through Phineas's head, Phineas just stood there upright with his eyes wide, and then suddenly a geyser of blood began shooting out of the top of his head, and then Phineas fell backwards onto the ground. When Phineas's body hit the ground, he began having a seizure, at which point his co-workers, who were still kind of shaken up from this sudden blast, they rushed over and tried to kind of position him in a way that he wouldn't hurt himself, but I mean, they're looking at him, and he's literally missing half of his head, he's covered in blood, and they're thinking, you know, there's nothing we can do for him, but basically wait for him to die. And so all of Phineas's co-workers, who adored Phineas, just stood there very somber watching their boss die. But eventually Phineas stopped having a seizure and then he opened his eyes and he looked up at his crew and he sat up and he said, what happened? Now remember, half of his head has been blown out by a 13 pound, four foot long metal rod that has shot through his head. And his coworkers, when they heard how clearly he was speaking and how focused his eyes were, I mean, they couldn't believe it. How in the world is this guy alive, let alone having a coherent conversation with them? And so the coworkers told Phineas, please lie down, we'll get you help, lie down, relax. But Phineas, who still had blood also shooting out of his head, just kind of stood up casually and walked over to the railroad cart and signaled for his crew to take him back into town. And so the crew, they're looking over at Phineas, who now is literally head to toe, just red from blood, still bleeding, but less so. And he's just sitting on the railroad cart waiting for them. And so they walk over to him and they start the slow one mile journey into town on this railroad cart. And the whole time they're all kind of looking at Phineas, expecting him to die any second. But instead, Phineas is just kind of looking around with half of his head. And at some point he pulled out his log book and carefully wrote down what time they were leaving their work site to make sure his crew was accurately paid. And then finally they reached town and Phineas was still very much alive and looking around, acting like nothing had happened to him. And the co-workers helped him to his hotel and Phineas just sat outside on a chair in front of his hotel, just people watching while his crew went and got a doctor. A doctor soon arrived and he too was completely shocked at Phineas's appearance, but even more so was Phineas's eyes. He looked at the doctor and his eyes were totally focused, like he was all there, totally lucid, looking at the doctor, waiting for him to come over and help him out with his little injury. And when the doctor kind of timidly approached Phineas, Phineas very famously said as he sat on his chair, Doctor, here's business enough for you. Like everyone else, the doctor fully assumed that despite Phineas's miraculous recovery from this injury, that he would soon die from this horrific wound in his head. And so the doctor moved Phineas up into the hotel, put him in a bed, and then basically made him comfortable. Now, the doctor at this point was not trying to save Phineas. He felt like there was nothing he could do to save Phineas. At this point, it was like mercy. Let's make this as pain-free as possible for Phineas as he inevitably dies from this injury. But Phineas didn't die. He would break out of it and basically be okay again. However, his personality at first, after he came out of this state of delirium, was not really the same. No longer was he this funny, smart, charming, confident leader. Instead, he was this guy who seemed to have lost all of his inhibitions and was kind of childlike. He swore all the time. He would tell people he had these crazy plans he was going to go do, but he would never follow through with them. And he would tell his nieces and nephews these wild stories about himself that were obviously made up and not even close to reality. But overall, he was okay, even though you could see his brain pulsing underneath his skin on the side of his head that had been blown off. And within a couple of years of this injury, those changes to Phineas's personality kind of faded, and he really did become old Phineas. However, there was one unique quirk to Phineas post-injury that never went away. And that was Phineas's kind of unhealthy love for the tamping iron that had blown through his head. After his injury, Phineas kind of stopped making friends and any friends he did have, he really didn't try to keep those relationships up. He didn't get married, he didn't have kids. Instead, the tamping iron became sort of like his best friend. 
He took it everywhere with him, even posing at one point with the tamping iron the way you would expect a couple to pose for a photo. 12 years after his horrific injury, Phineas would develop seizures, likely from the injury, and then he would die with his beloved tamping rod right by his side. His case changed neuroscience forever by showing that an injury to the brain could affect specific personality traits. Today, Phineas's skull and his tamping rod are on display at Harvard Medical School. On September 12, 1916, residents of the little mining town called Kingsport, Tennessee, left their homes and packed the main street. Because on this day, a traveling circus called Sparks World Famous Shows was coming to town. The performers in this traveling circus were going to put on a big parade and then end it with a traditional circus act. This was going to be the most exciting and biggest event that had ever happened in Kingsport. Kingsport was not an affluent place. Most people lived in tents instead of homes, and many of the roads were mud. And so they were really desperate for something fun and exciting to happen. By around noon, all the residents who were lining the main street began hearing the sound of music off in the distance. And then from around the corner came clowns who were banging cymbals and blowing on kazoos. And then there were acrobats and dogs painted different colors. And there were men juggling and walking on stilts and walking upside down. There were horses and lions and trained sea lions. I mean, this parade was a total spectacle and the residents of Kingsport loved it. They were screaming and cheering with excitement. But the most exciting part of this parade were the elephants. There were five of them and they were at the front of the parade and they each had their trunks wrapped around the other elephant's tail. So they were walking in a line. And the elephant at the very front of these five elephants was very clearly the star of the show. Her name was Mary and the owner of the circus, whose name was Charlie Sparks, advertised Mary as being the largest living land animal on Earth. She weighed more than five tons, which is 10,000 pounds, and Charlie had had her since she was a baby, and he had taught her many tricks. She could stand on her head, she could play 25 songs on a trumpet, and she could throw a baseball. Charlie loved Mary like she was his child, and Charlie knew that Mary was really his ticket to real success. At this time in America, there were lots of other traveling circuses that Charlie had to compete with, and generally speaking, Charlie's circus was on the smaller side. And so this was frustrating for Charlie because he was always trying to find new ways to grow his circus and make it more fun and enjoyable, but a lot of his efforts didn't really work out. However, he at least had Mary, who always seemed to draw a crowd. And when Mary walked down Main Street of Kingsport, everybody was totally amazed by her, and they were totally jealous of the man on her back who got to ride her. It was her handler. His name was Red Edridge. When the parade finally came to an end, and Charlie was getting ready to shift the entire performance from parade to traditional circus act, Red, Mary's handler, took Mary and led her over to a nearby pond to let her get a drink of water. Red, who was 38 years old, was new to elephant handling. In fact, Charlie had hired him just a day earlier when Charlie's show had passed through Virginia, where Red was working as a janitor. Animal handlers in Charlie's show were all trained to treat the animals gently, especially Mary. But Red was a grouchy person who was a very skinny guy with bright red hair, and he had been teased for much of his life, which had kind of made him a mean person. And so as he and Mary are walking over to this pond, Mary saw a watermelon on the ground and stopped to eat it. And as she was doing this, Red noticed there was a group of people kind of forming up around them, just kind of amazed by Mary. And they were noticing that Red was trying to get Mary to go to the pond to get her drink of water. And she wasn't listening. She was focused on the watermelon. And so Red very likely started to feel insecure that they would think he wasn't in control of the animal. And so he got mad and he took his metal prod and he jabbed it into the side of Mary's head right behind her ear breaking her skin. Now, Mary was a very gentle creature, but over the past 24 hours that Red had been her new handler, 
he had been cruel like this. And so when he poked her with that prod, it was like Mary snapped. Mary dropped the watermelon, turned to face Red, and Red, he's startled by this and just kind of stares up at Mary, wondering what's going on. And Mary would wrap up Red in her long trunk and throw him into a nearby drink stand. At this point, the crowd of children and other people from Kingsport who were watching Mary started to scream and run away. And Mary, she was not done with Red, who was now groaning and rolling over onto his back. Mary walked over to Red, and then she got up on her hind legs and came crashing down directly, all 10,000 pounds of her, onto Red's skull, killing him instantly. Charlie heard all this commotion over near the pond and he ran over and he found Mary looking totally terrified. And so he began to comfort her. And then he noticed on the ground next to her was Red's mangled body. And around this time, the townspeople who had run in fear had now come back and they saw what Mary had done. And instead of being scared of Mary, all these townspeople got angry and began screaming at Mary the elephant, murderer, murderer. This was, of course, a worst case scenario for Charlie, just from a business perspective, because Mary was the star of his show and she had just very publicly killed her handler. In the hours after Red's death, news of murderous Mary began spreading around town and to other towns nearby. And before long, there was a mob of people trying to kill Mary who had to be held back. And then also the sheriff of Kingsport at some point came up to Mary and fired his gun at her. But Mary was so big and her skin was so tough, the bullets did not penetrate. Also, within hours of Red being killed, the town that Charlie and his circus were supposed to go to next sent word that they were not allowed to come if Mary was going to be with them. Charlie knew that at this point, even though Mary had been the star of his show, that if he didn't get rid of her, he would be out of business. He'd be financially ruined. However, he loved Mary. She was his oldest and most loyal partner, and he couldn't imagine giving her up. But Charlie was also very ambitious, and he had a whole crew of people in his circus that depended on doing these shows to make a living. And so on the night of Red's death, Charlie would lay awake all night just thinking about what he was going to do. And by early the next morning, Charlie had come up with a plan. Charlie ordered his entire circus to pack up and get back on the train. They were going to head to the next town called Irwin. And Charlie said, once they got there, they would put on a show that no one in the world had ever seen before. Spark's world famous shows arrived in Irwin at about 10 a.m. that day. And immediately all the performers began setting up for this big show, which again would start with a parade followed by a circus act and then a grand finale. Now, Irwin was already packed by the time the circus actually arrived because news of what Charlie had planned for this grand finale had reached Irwin and the surrounding towns, and so everybody had flooded this town to see it. At midday, Charlie's team was ready and they began the parade, but Mary was not a part of the parade. Instead, she was chained up inside of the main circus area where the circus act would take place after the parade ended. And when the parade ended, it put on the circus act right around Mary, but Mary was not unchained. She was left in the middle of the circus, just kind of standing there, not sure what to do. She kind of swayed around with the music and trumpeted a few times, but she was confused and no one really knew what she was doing there. And then finally, the main circus act came to an end and most of the performers went back into their tents. And at this point, all of the crowd who had been watching the circus began making their way over to the railroad yard. At the same time, Charlie and several of the animal handlers came out and grabbed the four other elephants who were not chained up, and they went over to Mary, and they unchained her, and then they formed all the elephants up in a line, with each of the trunks connected to the tail of the next elephant. And they marched all five elephants over to the railroad yard, where now there was a massive crowd that also included the press, who had shown up with their cameras, ready to capture the grand finale. Charlie led Mary and the other four elephants onto the railroad tracks, which were up on this embankment. And once they got up there, Charlie halted the other four elephants and sent them away with their handlers and left Mary all alone on the railroad tracks. 
And at this point, as Charlie is consoling her, one of the circus performers came over and chained Mary's back legs to the railroad tracks. Now, Mary was extremely well-trained, and Charlie is right there comforting her. And so even though she was nervous as she was getting chained up, she didn't try to fight it. And as this was happening, a railroad worker climbed into a machine called a derrick, which is basically a big crane that's able to lift heavy things like lumber off of the railroad cars. And so this worker hops in the derrick, which is on tracks, and he brought it over right behind Mary. And so once the derrick was in place, and once Mary was securely fastened to the tracks, another worker climbed up onto the crane of the derrick, so the actual arm that was jutting out over Mary. This worker climbed up on top of it, and he grabbed the chain that was dangling off of it, and he jumped onto Mary's back, carrying this chain, and he looped it around Mary's neck and secured it, and then jumped off of Mary. At this point, Charlie, who was still holding on to Mary's trunk and comforting her, gave her one last embrace and then turned away from her and walked down the embankment toward the huge crowd who had now gone totally silent, sensing the grand finale was about to start. Once Charlie reached the crowd, he turned around to face Mary. He signaled the railroad worker in the derrick, who then pulled a lever inside of the derrick. At this point, the only sound that could be heard across the whole railroad yard was the sound of this chain that had just been activated slowly being retracted by the derrick. And so as it was, it was pulling Mary up off the ground by her neck. And so as it tightened around Mary's neck and she realized she couldn't go anywhere because she's anchored to the tracks by her back legs, she began to panic and she kept looking over at Charlie and trumpeting, trying to get someone to help her but no help came. And eventually the derrick tightened so much that it lifted Mary's front legs off the ground and her back legs were still on the ground. And so with one last look over at Charlie, she let out a trumpeting call and then her back legs left the ground and she went silent and she was hung there until she died. Mary's public execution was Charlie's big grand finale to this show. He had killed off this murderous elephant in an effort to appease the masses and save his circus business. And it did work. His circus continued to grow for a number of years. I mean, lots of people were interested in coming to see whatever he was doing because of the infamy around Mary. But after killing Mary, Charlie was never the same. He would actually retire early and then die in 1944. Today, Irwin, Tennessee is still known as the town that hung the elephant. Saturday, April 25th, 1987, was a beautiful spring day in the mountains of Northwest Montana. It was exactly the kind of day that 40-year-old Charles Gibbs and his wife Glenda had been waiting for for months. The sky was clear, the sun was bright, and the breeze was warm. And so, at around 9 a.m. that morning, Charles and Glenda had a quick breakfast inside of their house in the rural city of Libby, and then they started stuffing their backpacks full of their hiking equipment. Charles and Glenda were going to go to Glacier National Park, which is a one million acre wilderness preserve with alpine meadows, forests, rivers, and lakes that are so bright and crystal blue, they almost look like they're glowing. The park is ringed by snow-covered mountains, and it's dotted with glaciers, which are huge masses of pure ice that jut up out of the rock and make you feel like you've stumbled onto some ancient frozen planet. The park is actually so otherworldly that when Hollywood producers were looking for a location to shoot the heaven scene in the big movie What Dreams May Come, they chose Glacier National Park as their location. And for Charles and Glenda, this place practically was heaven. It was the place they went all the time to go hiking, especially on beautiful sunny spring days. After packing all of their gear, Charles and Glenda made their way out the front door and began heading to their car, when as they were walking, Charles suddenly stopped short, shook his head, turned around, and ran back inside the house. When he came back out again, he was carrying his camera bag, and so he ran over to the car, he sat down in the driver's seat, and he grinned at his wife, and he held up the bag, and he said, now we're ready. Both Charles and Glenda worked for the public schools in Libby. Glenda was an elementary school teacher and Charles drove a school bus. 
But like a lot of people who lived in Montana, their real passion was the outdoors. And for Charles specifically, his real passion was wildlife photography. He was actually a pretty accomplished amateur photographer. He'd had a couple of photo exhibits locally, and he'd gotten a few of his pictures published in the local newspaper. But what Charles really wanted to do with his photography was get one of his wildlife pictures published in a weekly publication called the Hungry Horse News. The Hungry Horse News was a tiny publication, but they had won a Pulitzer Prize, which is the highest award for American journalism. And the Hungry Horse News was famous for its nature photography. Charles had been submitting his work for years to the Hungry Horse News, but the editor kept rejecting them, telling Charles that his photos were totally beautiful, but they weren't dynamic enough. Nothing was happening in these photos. And so that morning on the couple's drive to Glacier National Park, Charles began talking out loud to Glenda about what strategy he was going to use for his photographs during their hike. You know, what route they were going to be on and what was the best angle to take certain pictures. And as Glenda listened to Charles, she just smiled to herself because it was like no matter how many times Charles got shot down by the Hungry Horse News, she knew he was never going to give up. And so she loved his determination and just unflappable attitude about his craft. At around 11 a.m., Charles and Glenda pulled off the highway and began heading towards the trailhead where they would start their hike that day, which was located at the base of Elk Mountain on the southern border of the park. The route they had chosen for that day was not one of the most popular at the park. And the reason for that was the trail was really steep and in certain parts of it, it was fairly overgrown. And so really only the most hardcore hikers would go up this trail of which there weren't that many. And so Charles and Glenda were used to being on this trail and seeing no one, but they preferred it that way. They loved being alone out in nature. Finally, they reached the gravel parking lot right at the trailhead and Charles parked their car and then he and Glenda hopped out. They grabbed their bags and then began walking on this trail. The first mile of this trail brought the couple out along an abandoned road and then over some railroad tracks and then out into this beautiful field full of white flowers. And then the trail really started to get difficult because it basically went straight up the side of a mountain. And as they walked up this really steep part of the trail, Charles was nonstop taking pictures of everything he saw. There were deer and mountain goats. And at some point, the couple reached a clearing on the steep section where they could look down and see a lake. And they saw there were beavers hard at work building a dam. And so of course, Charles got a picture of that too. Now, these were the days before digital photography, and so all these pictures that Charles was taking, he couldn't actually see. He needed to go home and develop the film to see if anything he took was worth keeping. But as Charles and Glenda continued their hike up this mountain, Charles was getting more and more excited about some of the shots he was getting. He felt like they were gonna be really, really good, and Hungry Horse News was going to finally accept his work. The couple made it to the summit of this trail by early afternoon, and from up there, they had this beautiful panoramic view of all these jagged mountaintops that were covered in snow, separated by these huge valleys and prairies, and Charles and Glenda were the only ones up there, and so they had this unbelievable view all to themselves. And so the couple would eat the lunch that they brought with them while sitting on this rocky outcropping, kind of looking out over this stunning view. And then when they were done, they packed up their stuff and began heading back down because they knew they wanted to get off of this trail and out of the park before sundown. It was just about 5 p.m. when Charles and Glenda had reached the final slope of this steep section of the trail, and they were getting closer and closer to that big open field with the white flowers. And as they're going down this last section of steepness, Charles suddenly grabs Glenda and stops her and puts his fingers to his lips and then turns around and points behind him. Charles was visibly excited about whatever he was pointing at, but when Glenda looked in the direction he was pointing, she couldn't see anything, but she obviously knew that whatever he was pointing at, Charles wanted to take a picture of it. Now, Glenda by this point was really tired from the hiking and just wanted to go back to the car and go home. I mean, after all, Charles had taken dozens and dozens of pictures that day, like we don't need to get one more. And so Glenda would look at Charles impatiently, basically suggesting like, come on, we can come back another time. But Charles didn't budge. And he looked at her like, please, I wanna get one more photo. And so Glenda kind of did one of these and was like, okay. And Charles said, thank you, I'll meet you at the car. 
And so Glenda stood there and watched as her husband got his camera out, turned around, and began slowly making his way back up the trail. And again, Glenda's looking. She can't see what he's going to take a picture of, but she figured, you know, he had his plan. And Glenda, she turned around and began heading back down towards the car. It didn't take long for Glenda to get back to the car. She got there right around 6 p.m. And when she got there, she hopped inside, sat in the front passenger seat, turned on the radio, and then she expected to have to wait for maybe another 20 minutes or so for Charles to finish up and come join her. But Glenda, after sitting in the car, was so tired that she accidentally fell asleep. And when she woke up again, she was kind of disoriented, and immediately she looked to see if her husband was in the car with her, and he wasn't. And she's looking outside, it's getting pretty dark out. She glanced at her watch, it was 7 p.m., which means Charles had left her for at least an hour by this point. And she's thinking, there's no way Charles would have been gone for an hour. He would never do that. He would never leave me alone like that. And so Glenda began glancing around her, kind of half expecting to see Charles just outside of their car, you know, doing something, but she was all alone. There was no other hikers or cars, Charles wasn't there. And so starting to panic, Glenda got out of her car and began hustling back onto the trail to go look for Charles. And so she's yelling for Charles, she's looking around, it's getting darker and darker, and there's no sign of Charles. He's not calling back to her, it's just totally silent. She walks along the abandoned road, she reaches the railroad tracks, she gets into that meadow with the white flowers, and still there's no sign of Charles. And she gets to the base of that steep section of the trail, and she's looking up at all these trees and how dark it was getting, and she's thinking to herself, if Charles is in trouble somewhere up there, there's no way I can help him by myself in the dark with no equipment, no one knows I'm here. I mean, this is an emergency and I need help. And so Glenda would scream a few more times for Charles and after not hearing any response, she turned and ran all the way back to her car. She turned it on and she drove to the nearest ranger station. When she got there, she ran inside and immediately told the ranger where her and Charles had been, which trail they were on, and where roughly they were on this trail when she had gone to the car and Charles had turned around and gone uphill to take a picture of something. And as Glenda told the ranger all these details about where they were inside of the park, he really started to look worried. And when Glenda was done explaining, he told her that, yes, we need to go right now and look for your husband, but I can't have you on that trail. It's too dangerous. And so this ranger had Glenda wait at the ranger station, and the ranger, by himself, headed back to the trailhead to go looking for Charles. And so the ranger, he gets to the trailhead, he hops out, he's got a rifle and a flashlight, and he begins walking along this trail, and by now, it's dark out. And so he's looking straight ahead with his flashlight and scanning side to side, he's calling out for Charles, and he's walking this trail, he gets all the way across the train tracks, through the meadow, and he gets to the steep section, and he actually begins begins going up this part of the trail until roughly the area where Glenda had described Charles going one way and her going back down. And when he got there, there was no sign of Charles. And so the ranger just took his rifle and fired three shots into the air, hoping that that might get Charles, if he was in the area, to hear him and call out or do something to indicate where he had gone. But after firing his gun, the ranger heard nothing. By this point, it was approaching midnight, it was totally pitch black outside, and the ranger knew that at this point, Charles was missing, and they really needed to organize a true search party to try to find him. But they would have to do that the next morning when they had light again. And so the ranger called out a few more times for Charles, and after not hearing anything, he reluctantly turned around and made his way back to his truck and drove back to the ranger station where he would tell Glenda that he could not find her husband and they would now have to wait for sunrise. At sunrise the next morning, 20 searchers arrived at the trailhead where Charles and Glenda had been, and these searchers had dogs, and all the dogs had Charles's scent from some clothes that was in Glenda's car, and so this big search team very slowly and methodically began moving down this trail, and so they went across the abandoned road, over the train tracks, through the meadow with the white flowers, they got to the steep section of the trail, and they got all the way up to that point where Charles and Glenda had separated, and Charles had gone uphill to do whatever he was going to do. And it was at that point on the steep section that one of the searcher's dogs picked up Charles's scent and took off running uphill. 
and the searcher, whose dog this was, took off running after the dog, and the dog, it went up for a little while, up the steep rocky outcropping, and then it turned and began going down again until it reached a different meadow, so not the same one they walked through with the white flowers. This was farther away to the right, and in this meadow, the dog, who still very much had the scent, began to slow down, and it went straight for this tree. It was kind of a standalone tree right at the base of this steep section, and this tree had low hanging branches, maybe five feet off the ground, and the dog went right up to the tree, and then it stopped for a second, and the searcher by this point had caught up to the dog, and so he's looking at this tree, and he sees the ground looks really disturbed, and there's deep gouges in this tree, and then the dog went around this tree and sprinted another 50 feet or so, and then stopped like it had found something. And when the searcher caught up to his dog, he looked down and he found what they feared the most. It was Charles and he was deceased. His body was totally mangled. His arms and legs were eaten away. There were deep cuts and gouges all over his body. And there was a blood trail from Charles all the way back to this tree. Also, just a few feet from Charles's outstretched hand was a camera, Charles's camera. Now, it was obvious that something horrific had happened to Charles, and there were clear signs of a struggle that took place near this tree, and then also over here where he was found, there were clear marks on the ground that there was some sort of fight that happened right here. But interestingly, Charles was carrying a gun, but it appeared that he did not unholster it and he didn't fire it. Instead, it almost looked like whatever was happening to Charles, he refused to put his camera down, which is why it was so close to his hand when he finally died. And so it was decided that the only way to determine what happened to Charles would be to develop his camera, to figure out what he was taking pictures of before he died. And so authorities would send off Charles's camera roll to be developed. And two weeks later, when they got it back, they couldn't believe what they saw. The photos very clearly told the story of what happened to Charles. This is what happened after Charles left his wife on that trail. When Charles stopped his wife and signaled to her that he wanted to take one more picture up the trail, he had found a photographic opportunity of a lifetime. The warm spring weather that had drawn Charles and Glenda out of their house to Glacier National Park had also woken the grizzly bears in the park from their hibernation. And what Charles had seen up the trail was a mother grizzly bear and her three cubs. The first few photographs that Charles would take of these bears were shot from a good distance away, and it just showed the mother bear and her three babies just kind of sauntering around the rocks, not really paying any attention to Charles. To Charles, grizzly bears were the most majestic creatures in nature. He didn't just love them, he viewed them as if they were sort of magical in some way. He was always going to local town meetings to speak about grizzly bears' beauty and we needed to defend their natural habitat. As such, anyone who knew Charles knew about his passion for grizzlies. And while of course Charles knew that grizzly bears were dangerous, he also thought that the bears, who were very smart and sensitive, could sense his own very gentle and protective feelings towards them, and so if he was around them, they would never perceive him as a threat. Charles had taken some very good photos of other bears, black bears, but he had never taken what he called the definitive grizzly bear photo. And it was going to be this definitive grizzly photo of the mother and her three cubs that would finally get him a spot in the Hungry Horse News publication. As Charles took more and more photos of these bears, you could see in the photos that Charles was getting closer and closer and closer to this mother bear and her cubs. It was obvious that he was tracking them, even as the mother bear and the cubs were clearly trying to walk away from him. Finally, when Charles got about 50 feet away from this family of grizzly bears, he must have kicked a rock or stepped on a twig that broke that startled the bears. And so the second to last photo that Charles would take of this family shows the mother bear very clearly turning around to look at Charles. And she's making perfect eye contact with him, as is one of her cubs. Charles would take one more photo. And in this photo, you can see the bears are not just staring at Charles, they are running towards him. They are charging him. 
and it was likely after taking this photo that Charles realized the danger he was in. At this point, Charles tried to make a run for it by running down the side of this mountain. He got down to that tree with the low hanging limbs and he attempted to climb up into it, maybe hoping he could get one more picture of this bear if they would just leave him alone. But the mother bear and her cubs, they came charging down. They saw him up in the tree and the mother bear began climbing into the tree and she reached Charles. Now, she likely weighed about 400 pounds, and when mother grizzly bears are defending their young, they are absolutely merciless. And so she must have grabbed him or bit onto him and yanked him from the tree. And Charles somehow, after being pulled to the ground and getting slashed and bit by this bear, he managed to break away from her, as we can tell from the blood trail, and he made it about 50 feet away from this tree before the bear chased him down again, jumped on top of him, and killed him. When authorities figured out that Charles had managed to briefly get away from this mother grizzly bear and made it 50 feet away from her, they wondered why he hadn't pulled out his gun and shot at the bears to defend himself. But Charles's wife, Glenda, said it made perfect sense that Charles had not tried to harm this grizzly bear or her cubs. He loved grizzly bears, and he would never dream of leaving these three cubs without their mother. After Charles's death, the rangers did not attempt to track down this bear and her cubs and do anything to the bears, because they felt like the bears were just acting like bears, and it was Charles who was in the wrong and Charles's family and friends would say that is a decision that Charles would definitely support. Charles's photos of the grizzly bear family were published in the Hungry Horse News alongside an article about his death. 